Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello everyone and welcome back to Spindle TV. Let's see if we can straighten up that camera so I'm not so crooked and everything. I uh, want to thank you all for joining me tonight. Uh, it's going to take a moment to get everybody in there. Uh, and uh, But we have a few people popped in. Uh, Roger, Kevin, and Alan. Alan, uh, I got your email and I'll be sending out your files and everything to you probably tonight after class. So just wanted to give that shout out to everyone. And uh, I hope you all had a good weekend. Uh, I had a great weekend. We got to spend uh, time with some of our digital woodcarver owners uh, up in Easton, Pennsylvania uh, for a user group uh, meetup and event and uh, training session and everything. And it was really nice. It was a good weekend. I'm looking forward to uh, the 25th and 26th, I believe, of July uh, we're gonna be down here in Ocala Florida for those that are uh, users that are coming out here and joining you know but uh, everything is um, looks to be going well uh, with the stream so that's a good thing uh, can't complain there tonight I don't have a particular uh, class uh, as far as a project or anything what I would like to do is over the last couple of classes and also looking at some of the comments uh, on some of the YouTube videos there were some general questions uh, I'd like to cover and answer some of those but I'd also like to answer your questions <laughs> any obstacles or uh, things that you might be uh, running up into in the Vetric software whether it be Vetric VCard desktop VCard Pro or Vetric Aspire uh, I'd like to be able to open the floor to your questions and, uh, you know, go through them and, and help kind of possibly get you past some of the obstacles that you might be facing uh, within your software. Uh, one of the things we will cover, one of the questions that I'm going to be covering is uh, a customer was um, trying to add a form tool, a special profile bit to their tool database and they said no matter how much they try, they couldn't get it to add. And it's because it's a unique style bit, and I want to talk a little bit about the the form tools uh, and adding them. Form tool, when the term form tool just means a bit with a special profile. I want to talk a little bit about them and uh, let you know, you know, some of the tools that that you wouldn't be able to use uh, or at least put into the the tool database, and some that you will, and how you would have to do that. So that would be one thing I'd like to cover. And we see everybody popping in. That's wonderful. Uh, hello um, to all of you, Stephen, David, Reginald, John. Uh, but uh, so I, I hope that y'all participate with some questions, and I hope we can go through and answer those questions for you, because it's all about learning, uh, you know. And and some of the questions that you might have will be uh, possibly want to be heard uh, by other individuals, and also what those answers would be uh, that might help them along they could be facing the same obstacles and stuff so please uh, you know ask your questions and everything and uh, you can go ahead and start typing them up in the chat room and everything if you do have questions and all uh, what I'm gonna start with is, while uh, waiting for those questions to pop up uh, what I'm gonna start with is uh, talking about adding form tools special profile tools to the tool database and we're specifically gonna cover one particular uh, form tool and let me see if I can go ahead and get that uh, pulled up and uh, ready and then we'll switch over but like I said I want to thank each and every one of you now I know tonight's not a regularly scheduled night we uh, we had to postpone 
uh, from last week from my trip uh, up to Pennsylvania and then of course getting back at 6 a.m. this morning uh, we weren't able to do class last night so tonight is uh, our, our class event and then next week we'll be back on our regular schedule Monday now the following weekend uh, that most likely will be a Tuesday class as well I'll let you know um, uh, somehow or another I need to find out a good way to notify those of you that uh, are not digital woodcarver owners and are not part of the owners group because you're not digital woodcarver owners you might have your own CNC machine or a different brand and stuff but I need to find out a good way to be able to notify you if there's a schedule change and I think I'm going to do that uh, on spindletv.com now that website is under construction it's not ready to launch just yet but I think I'm going to work on that uh, this weekend or this week should I say uh, after class tonight and try to get at least the home page set up to where I could put some kind of calendar on there so that you can see if a class is postponed or something a way of notifying those of you that are not in the owners group because you don't have you don't own a digital wood cover I'd like to be able to notify everybody so that y'all you all y'all that's my southern term uh, so that you all do not miss uh, an event or pop in on Monday going where's Laney at you know or something like that so I'm gonna try to work on that uh, let me see let's see this is called a uh, threading router yep. Let's see if I can, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna switch over to our, <clears throat> sorry, I'm gonna switch over to our other screen here. And let's go ahead and get onto that uh, full screen capture. And you'll see this bit that I have pulled up. It's a magnate bit. It's a, it's a thread cutting carbide tipped uh, router bit. And basically, think of like a V-bit that's to the side. Instead of uh, coming down at a point and everything, it comes to the side of the point. And a lot of people refer to this as a bird mouth bit. Uh, it's a thread cutting bit, basically. And because of the unique profile, um, someone was trying to draw this bit into you know the right side of this bit to get it into the tool database and it just wasn't taking it. it it wasn't taking it and so what I'd like to do is show how to add that bit into the tool database and um, just make sure you kind of understand uh, the difference of working with uh, profile bits that uh, unlike a keyhole bit a dovetail bit these two bits require a dummy end mill which is basically a uh, uh, it's set up in the tool database as an end mill uh, because all it's doing is reading the feeds and speeds you know the RPMs and the feed rate and the plunge rate off of it uh, it's it's probably reading the step overs and stuff as well but we use a dummy bit because we can't draw in that dovetail profile or we can't draw in that keyhole profile and this particular bit is one of those type of bits as well um, it it does the same thing and uh, thanks everybody for popping in uh, it's wonderful to see all of you here tonight and everything so I'm gonna just create a, a generic file for the moment and I'm gonna uh, let's go with uh, 12 inch by 12 inch by 3 quarter I work off the bottom of my board uh, my waste board so I work off the machine bed my waste board is Z0 uh, and I always uh, I work from the bottom left corner of my material and again this is subjective it's up to you uh, as far as if you're working if you're touching off on the top of your material or the bottom uh, or if you're working from the center or from one of the four corners and all and so uh, I'm gonna s click OK to set up and let's draw out uh, this profile bit so uh, first things first is let me grab this and pull it over to the other screen because I want to pull the dimensions and everything off 
And this particular bit has a cutting height of a quarter of an inch. It's got a quarter inch shank. Uh, it's got a, I'm sorry, it's got a three eighths inch cutting height, not a quarter inch. Uh, it's got a, um, a five eighths inch overall diameter and it's a two flute and it's 90 degrees. Uh, so if we were to draw that out, uh, we're gonna go with a width of five eighths, 0.625 and a height of three eighths, 0.375 and I'm just going to uh, pop that rectangle on the screen here so that you can see it uh, now this particular bit has a on that overall uh, cutting width which is the 5 8 cutting diameter let's call it um, it has a 90 degree V at it so let's imagine if I grab a guide here and uh, let's close this tool for a minute so I can grab one of my guides and if I snap this guide to the center here and I make a relative guide that is a quarter of an inch I'm sorry that is an eighth of an inch uh, to the right of that guide and then an eighth of an inch to the left of that guide uh, that kind of gives me my router bit shank okay let's just do that and then from there I'm gonna take and uh, at the center here uh, would it be at the center uh, no it'd be here I'm gonna go 45 and let me find my 45 45 and then it comes across 45 and 45 if I hit the space bar here if I get rid of my guides now if I uh, you know let's get rid of the guides and if I come in and do some trimming uh, let's imagine that we trim this stuff away this is pretty much the profile shape of that router bit and the on that profile shape the we can't have the undercut which is basically this top side and when the gentleman was drawing it I can almost guarantee that uh, he was trying to draw the right side of the profile which if I go into node editing mode um, if I go into node editing and if I came in here and I split this bit in half by cutting the vector here and if I cut it right here on this corner if I were to get rid of all of, um, oops, sorry, hold on a minute there. Let's uh, undo that. Let me make sure everything is grouped together or joined together, should I say. <clears throat> okay, so I got one open vector right here. Let me delete that. It was a duplicate. It was throwing me off. And if I were to cut this vector here, and come down to the center and cut this vector if I were to get rid of this kind of like left side basically this would be technically the right side of that profile and uh, I'm, I'm almost 100% positive he was trying to draw that profile in well the software wouldn't take it if I try to add this right now as it stands if I were to go into the tool database and I were to click on new form tool because I have it selected it's going to say that no suitable vector was uh, you know selected for the form tool it's it's gonna just create that error it's not gonna let me create it and that's because um, that's because the it can't really handle this undercut this back cut here so what I need to do is I need to go into node editing and I actually need to cut it right here on this midpoint and I need to get rid of this um, this top span and I have this profile because it's not gonna look normal uh, you know when you're doing a preview toolpath it's almost like a dovetail bit or a keyhole bit one of those special bits that really kind of just uses a dummy tool uh, but we're able to at least get uh, the the general profile in there 
but we can't have that upper span. So if I were to select this now and I would go into the tool database, then if I go to new and I select form tool, then it will create that, uh, that form tool and it's basically the lower half of that cutter. Okay, it's gonna give me my 5 8 inch overall diameter. Uh, it's gonna give me a, a, you know, a pass depth recommendation and stuff like that and, and everything. Now, one of the things that we have to understand is we're kind of dealing with helical arcs uh, if we're cutting internal threads. So the gentleman, and I wish I knew his name, I wish I would have uh, grabbed his name off of that uh, video comment. But um, what we need to understand is our pass depth is our thread spacing. Uh, and everything and so <clears throat> let's say that my thread spacing was uh, you know an eighth of an inch you know and I have an eighth of an inch taper uh, you know arc should I say or, or thread gap whatever you want to call it my spacing between each of my threads let's uh, click OK on that for a second let's come in here and draw something so let's uh, let's draw a <clears throat> rectangle and let's, uh, oh, how can I illustrate this? Well, uh, let's do it this way. Let's take a guide here and let's create a relative guide, an eighth of an inch, eighth of an inch, um, eighth, quarter, three eighths, so on and so forth. And let's say that on my threads, and this is going to be a terrible drawing, but bear with me. Uh, let's say on my threads, and get that. Space bar to finish. And let me do some trimming here. And let's get rid of those guides. So imagine this was, and it's only two of the three, but uh, here, we'll do this. Control key for making a copy and we'll snap that up there. And so let's imagine, it's a funky looking thread. You'll have to, you'll have to bear with me, but imagine that our spacing, our thread spacing was an eighth of an inch per thread. Then that's gonna be my pass depth in that tool database. When I'm working with that tool, my pass depth is gonna be that eighth of an inch. So your pass depth will vary based on that thread spacing, that thread count, you know, uh, per thread, you know, per inch <clears throat> and everything and all. So we don't necessarily need the whole bit drawn out because the Vetrix software won't let us, you know, have that whole right side of the profile because of the undercut. Uh, all we need is the basic general uh, look at the tool and uh, at least that bottom half uh, and then our thread spacing being whatever it is. Now, the step over the feed rate and the plunge rate, um, I'd probably run this tool somewhere between 22.5 and 24,000 RPMs. Um, I would most likely uh, run it around uh, probably 50 or 60 inches per minute, and my plunge would probably be around you know 15 or 20. I'll just make it 20, and everything, and that would be my tool. And if I were to you know create that tool path my spiral my spiral going around uh, when you're creating the tool path basically you would have your you, it's just a circle right you would have your opening uh, you know whatever diameter this thread's going to be let's say I was doing a half inch uh, let's go with a uh, one inch diameter make it, maybe I'm making a wooden nut or something with an internal one inch diameter uh, let's go ahead and make that uh, one and one then I would be doing a profile tool path on this and I would be cutting to whatever depth you know whatever depth I need to uh, cut and I would be uh, selecting that form tool for the cut and I'm going to be on the inside of the cut you know we're going to be on the inside working our way around but we have to have a step over and the step over on that uh, bit 
uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it is an eight, actually an eighth of an inch. So I'm gonna allow the bit to cross over the line, to cross over the line, that eighth of an inch, because, uh, oh, what's the best way to draw this out? Let me see if I can do this. Let's go 45 and 45, space bar. Let's go straight up, space bar. And let's join those two together as kind of one vector. When this bit is coming around and uh, cutting, I want the uh, shaft to almost basically be rubbing, not quite rubbing, the inside of that cut so that the thread cutter can actually cut the threads into uh, you know, the hole. So I need a step over. I need to let that bit cross over this line and it's gonna be a negative step over. So in my case, it'd be a negative point one, two, five. And when I calculate uh, this tool path, um, if we were to tilt this sideways, if we look right now, there's no ramping. There's no, it's just doing one pass, the next pass, the next pass, the next pass, and that's not correct. So in that tool profile, I have to add a ramp and actually a spiral ramp. And the spiral ramp is going to be based on my, it's going to be based on my pass depth uh, and everything. And my pass depth is that eighth of an inch, whatever that thread spacing is. And so when I, when I calculate this, you'll now see that bit is going to be traveling and dropping at that eighth of an inch as it's cutting those threads all the way around and everything and all that final hole. Now, when it comes to create, saving and creating the tool path for this, there's a few things uh, that we have to correct. Number one is, and I, I, this wasn't really to be a class on threading, but number one is, oops, let me back up where it is. Uh, my starting point is right here on the edge, and we can't have that we need it to basically start in the center, okay? So we have to create a lead in. We gotta create a lead in, uh, you know, from the center. So it comes down, it plunges in the middle of that hole because we've already got the pocket cleared out. And it comes down the middle of the hole, then it moves over and starts that, you know, spiral cut. And at the end of the cut, it needs to have a lead out. It's gotta go to the center. So if I came in here, and you know we're talking leads now you know at a lead it's going to be a straight lead uh coming you know um basically uh 90 degrees in <clears throat> and we want a straight lead uh that lead length could be uh, for me it's going to be half half the uh diameter of the uh tool uh, or the hole, uh, so I have a half inch, uh, I have a one inch hole, so my, my, my uh, distance is gonna be 0.5. And then, uh, and everything. And so, if I calculate this tool path, you'll now see that, let me back up so it can show. Now you're gonna see this crazy uh, thing to where it's leading in uh, and then coming around, then it's leading out, then it's leading in, it's leading out, it's leading in, it's leading out. We don't need all that. So let me get the lead out here. Let's turn that off. Okay. And it's creating geometry that we, we don't need uh, and everything. But I need that bit to go into the center and then come around, 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 and then out and cut. And there's actually a special modification that we have to do to the G-code. What I will do is um, I will create a, because it, it's I can't do it now, um, I will create a kind of a PDF with illustrations uh, on the, the uh, with, that'll show the actual G-code and it'll show you the areas of the G-code that you'll delete. You'll actually go in and edit the G-code in like Notepad or something. And there's going to be four lines that get removed completely out of there. And those four lines are going to be at the end where it wants to just circle all the way around. 
uh, we don't want that last motion, that last circle. Um, we, we don't want that at all. Uh, so we're going to end up removing that. But we have to create, we have to write in two lines of G-code uh, to make it start from the center and then come around, cut, cut, cut all the way down, and then go back to the center and then raise up out of the hole. That way it doesn't rip the threads, you know, cut the threads as it's raising up off of the edge and all. Um, but long story short, this isn't a class on threading. I will create that PDF and I'll make it a link that you can download uh, in the video description. Uh, it'll probably be up tonight. But when it comes to actually creating the tool, we just cannot create that upper vector. So if that gentleman happens to watch this video, hopefully he does, maybe he does, I don't know. But um, hopefully uh, he'll he'll be able to add that tool now to his tool database. And you know, just as a, a reference and stuff, the uh, magnate bit is a very cool. Uh, if you're into making wooded wood, like like threaded nuts and stuff, uh, this is a 90 degree uh, side cutting bit or thread cutting bit. It's a very cool bit. Um, uh, and it's on magnate.net for internal threads for making those wooden nuts. Now you would actually use a 90 degree V-bit, a regular 90 degree V-bit to cut the threads on the bolt part. Like if you have some type of fourth axis uh, ability and what have you to cut those th rotary threads and all. But it's a neat tool. I have it and uh, I make uh, wooden nuts and bolts like when I'm making bench vices and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Uh, so, and uh, it's a magnate thread cutting bit, magnate.net. All right, let's get back to the questions and all. And I will make that PDF available for a digital download uh, that shows how to create from start to finish the tool path for an internal thread and then how to alter, how to alter the G code so that it cuts the you know it moves into the center of the hole it comes down and starts cutting the thread around and then at the bottom of the thread it moves back to the center of the hole and raises up clearing the hole in the material and then going back wherever home or what have you i will write those instructions and i will uh provide those to you uh and everything uh and all and it, it's it's nice to know if you ever did want to make an internal thread for whatever reason maybe you're Maybe you're not making nuts and bolts or something, or maybe you just want to cut a thread so that a quarter 20 machine screw will, will screw into it or something like that. Whatever the case may be, uh, it's nice to know how to do that. So I'll provide that for you uh, and everything. So let's go back up to our uh, questions. And we have a gentleman from Mexico. Thank you for joining us, uh, uh, Gustavo. And uh, hola. And uh, como esta usted? I don't speak a whole lot of Spanish, but I will try my best to uh, uh, interpret your questions and stuff if you have them, you know. But uh, absolutely welcome uh, to the group for sure. So, <clears throat> Kevin Wilkerson, Wilkinson, uh, the question that you just asked: how, So, how would you set up to cut a thread? Uh, that's exactly what I was referring to. Uh, creating the tool path and everything is pretty straightforward, but it would be a spiral ramp. You got to have the spiral ramp, and you would have your pass depth for your tool set to that thread count per inch. Like if it's a quarter twenty, uh, that means th twenty threads per inch, you know, uh, and and everything, uh, quarter inch diameter bolt, you know, type of deal. Uh, and you know, threads depending on if they're metric or they're imperial and all, they will uh, vary that that spacing. And so our pass depth for that spiral ramp will vary to create those individual threads. And there's all different types of thread cutting bits and all. The instructions that I will provide will be for a 90 degree uh, thread cutting bit uh, from magnate.net, that specific tool. And, uh, but uh, it'll, it'll show you because creating the tool path is just creating that profile tool path, but we literally have to alter the G code tool path. We gotta open that file up in notepad and we're gonna have to add two lines and we're gonna have to remove, uh, I think it's four lines from the bottom, the last part of it and everything. And, and everything. We're going to have to add a line to make it start at the center and we're going to have to add a line at the bottom to make it end at the center so it clears that hole. And I'll have all of those in the instructions. I'll make a nice little PDF instructions and I'll make it available for a download. So hopefully that'll help you with that. Um, and uh, your uh, Michael Paris says your website 
down at the bottom isn't working for me. Um, Michael, come back into the comment section and let me know, be a little bit more specific, which website uh, at the bottom isn't working for you. Let me know which one, uh, which website you're referring to. And if you're referring to spindletv.com, that website is not, it's under construction. You could actually go to it and there's a lot of Latin language and everything. It's just a skeleton. There's no content in it whatsoever. But I will work on the content to be able to put a calendar or something up so everybody can be aware. But Michael, come back and let me know specifically what website you're referring to at the bottom uh, that isn't working for you and, and, and which one you're referring to. And we'll come back to that. Um, and uh, Michael, you had a second comment that you pulled back, but uh, I'm not sure what it is. But let's go to Kevin or Ken Singleton says, Laney, explain how to make a picture frame using the molding toolpath, allowing for an eighth inch dado on the back side for the picture opening, uh, you know, for the picture and the glass and all that stuff. And um, normally, uh, Ken, I usually have a quarter inch on the back, but we can do an eighth. But let's look at that. So let's imagine that I create a picture frame that is, uh, we'll do a rectangle. Let's go uh, 10 by eight. Uh, wouldn't it be eight wide on an eight by 10 frame? I think it would be uh, eight by 10. And let's get it uh, centered. I'm gonna hit F9 on my keyboard to get it centered onto the board here. And let's imagine that this is my outer profile of my frame. And let's say that I want my frame, my actual picture frame uh, to be, or my inner profile, because it's an eight by 10 picture, right? Let's say I want my picture to actually be, uh, my frame to be one inch wide. So I'm gonna offset this outward a distance of one inch, and I'm gonna make sharp corners, okay? I want sharp corners to create that one inch outer profile cut. So now I have my outer frame, and then I have my inner where my picture is gonna be, okay? Now, uh, this would normally be set up as a two-sided job, so let's go ahead and go, let's pop back over to the job setup and let's set it up as a two-sided job here. And I'm just gonna touch off on the bottom of the material for both sides for me, and I'm gonna flip it along my Y-axis and everything. So we'll click OK here. And what this will do is uh, this will allow me to have you know side one and side two and stuff. So on uh, my frame, uh, my molding and everything using the molding toolpath, I need to have a uh, a profile. So let's create a profile, a picture frame profile. Uh, so let's say I'm going to start off and uh, I'm going to start off with a rectangle and my rectangle is going to be one inch wide because that's how wide my frame is. And I'm going to go uh, five eighths uh, tall. Okay. And when you're creating a profile, I always, I mean, for me, I always start out with a rectangle, and I, but you don't need the bottom span. So if I come in and I go into node editing mode, I'm gonna right click on this bottom line, this bottom span, and I'm gonna delete that span because we only need the three sides of the profile. So let's say on my profile here, let's say on my profile, let me get it centered up here. Let's say that I wanna, let's pull this down. Uh, let's go about right here. And let's say on this line here, I'm gonna turn it into a Bezier curve. And let's put a little bit of a curve in this uh, picture frame profile. And let's say that I wanna put uh, a little bead uh, up here at the top. So I'm gonna draw a circle and let's put a bead up here at the top. And uh, let's say that I want a little bit of a cove. So we'll create a cove. And then I'm gonna take my line tool and I want a, I want a, nice, little, a nice little step down. I want it to step down and then just kind of like, uh, you know, step over and everything. Now, I can take my trim tool and I can create that bead and I can trim and create that step over, but I can't trim this cove yet because I have a major undercut. What I mean by undercut, for those of you that might not know, your router, uh, let's draw a mock-up router here for a second here. Uh, Let's draw a mock-up router. Let me get all this uh, centered. And let's, uh, let's do a little bit of trimming 
make it look like an actual oop don't trim that line away oop don't trim that line away all right so imagine that this is my router and my router bit and everything and I'm coming down and I'm cutting this cove right well I can't I don't have I don't have my router head doesn't have the ability uh, to rotate you know unless I have a five axis and all it doesn't have an ability to rotate to do this undercut so we can't have an undercut in this profile because uh, that bit is kind of plunging straight down and everything and it's not realistic size so don't worry we're not going to hit the bead or anything like that this is a small little uh, example uh, but let me move this out of the way what I need to do is I need to uh, place this cove in a position to where I don't have an undercut where I you know I'm coming straight down and I can come into the cut and now I can come in here and create that little cove uh, in there right all right so let's get rid of this mock-up a router So All right, bear with me a second guys. Bear with me a second. Okay, I had a uh, user coming in uh, that was uh, making some inappropriate comments, and uh, so I had to block them real quick. All right. So let's imagine now I've got my picture frame profile, uh, Ken, and uh, when I'm doing the molding toolpath, when I'm when I'm using the molding toolpath, I need to select my uh, drive rail first and then the profile last and so for me the and for you as well on a picture frame your drive rail is the inside rail so um, on the inside rail so I want to select that inside rail first that inside box <clears throat> and then I want to come in and select the profile and you'll see these lines span out showing you where that molding is going to get cut and if I were to undo that, let's say if I accidentally grab that outside rail and then the profile, well, all my lines now are, my molding is going to be on the outside of the picture frame. It's not, that's not where it needs to be. So we need to be the inside rail followed by the frame or the profile. Now, this little green node on your profile is your start point, meaning that if uh, that start point being on this low side, that means from the inside here, it's going to start low and go up high, you know, go to here towards the outside. And I don't want that. I want to be high and then I want to come down low on the, you know, on the, on the inside and all um, and everything. I want my frame to step out. So I want to right click on this green node and I want to reverse the direction. So it starts from here and works its way down and out on that profile. So my uh, toolpath and everything, I'll be using an eighth inch end mill, ball nose, tapered ball nose end mill to uh, cut that. And um, I don't have any larger clearance areas, so I'm going to turn that off and everything. And uh, I want sharp corners. I want this to look like a mitered picture frame. I want it to look like four pieces, two rails and two styles mitered together to create this picture frame. So I want sharp corners and I'm going to uh, calculate the toolpath from here. And so what we see is if we come in and preview this toolpath and everything, okay, we can see the uh, picture frame, you know, is starting wide. I've got my bead there, the cove, and then the step down. Now let's go ahead and do a profile cut and let's get rid of these uh, two sides here. So let's take my outer profile here and do a profile toolpath. Uh, I'm going to cut three quarters of an inch. Uh, I'm going to use my quarter inch end mill. I'm going to be on the outside of the cut 
I'm gonna, uh, I don't want any tabs. I wanna be able to delete these two sides for preview purposes. And I will add a ramp. I'm gonna do a zigzag ramp that's about one inch long. And I'm gonna hit calculate. And that way I can, you know, cut that part out so that we can, you know, see that, uh, you know, that picture frame. And let's turn the blue off. Uh, let's turn the color off so we can see that, uh, you know, that picture frame profile and all. Now, if I would have started that profile in the other direction, my short side would have been in here and then it would have gotten wider or higher as it went out and everything. But uh, that's how we would create the profile. Now... You know, we need to, now we need to, you know, we got to work on the pocket, you know, we got to work on the, the uh, cutout in the pocket where the, where the picture is going to go and stuff. So let's go back over here and let's uh, take our um, two profiles here and let's make a copy of them to the other side. And let's go to side two, our, our second side here. And on our second side, you know, this opening here, eight by 10 opening right here, that's where the picture is going to get cut. And so I need to uh, cut that hole out, uh, of course, but I also need a pocket where the uh, glass is gonna be held, the picture frame and the picture frame backer. And so uh, I wanna do an offset and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this um, a quarter inch, uh, you want it an eighth inch all the way around. I'll do an eighth inch all the way around, which will be like a quarter inch on both sides. So <clears throat> let's offset this outward uh, an eighth of an inch all the way around with sharp corners. And we'll create that offset. But then I also want to create an offset inward a little bit as well. So I want to go inward and I'll do the same thing, an eighth of an inch. And what this does is those two offsets give me my tool path for my pocket cut, okay? And so now I usually like a little bit more meat over here where my glass and my frame is gonna go, but an eighth of an inch is fine. It's an eighth of an inch all the way around. That's, that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. So we'll leave that. But let's do a pocket tool path. And now how deep do we want that recess? So I've got my glass. Let's say the glass is an eighth of an inch thick. I've got my uh, picture itself, which is very thin. And then I might have a backer, my frame backer that might have an easel on it for standing the frame up or something. And let's say my backer was, uh, let's say my backer was a quarter inch uh, piece of plywood or something. So we've got a quarter, we've got an eighth, and then a little bit for the picture. Uh, so let's go with a cut depth of, let's go with a cut depth of uh, a half inch. Yeah, we'll go a half inch. Uh, and I'm gonna use my uh, quarter inch end mill. And I wanna calculate this tool path. Now, here's the kicker. If I calculate this tool path right now, I'm gonna get a radius right here on the four corners where that bit's gonna come around and cut. And I do not wanna try to radius the four corners of my glass. I definitely don't want to have to try to radius my picture and I don't want to have to radius my um, my backer board. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself a fillet, a dog bone fillet on each of the four corners so that uh, my bit has somewhere to go instead of the corner of my materials and all. So let's do that real quick. Let's come over here to the fillet tool and I've got an eighth inch radius for my quarter inch bit and I'm just going to put a fillet on all four corners all four corners of that outside part. Okay, so now I've got my outside and I got my inside vector and we're gonna calculate this tool path. I'm gonna give myself a little bit of a ramp. Uh, I like ramps now, uh, it's really good on the tools and stuff. And this is gonna be my uh, back inner rabbit. 0.25 in mil. All right, so we'll preview that cut. So we have that rabbit, and now I need to, you know, cut out the uh, the the where the where the picture is going to go. Right, I got to cut out where the picture is going to go. So that middle line there, I'm going to do a profile cut, 
and this is going to cut all the way through and I since it is a two-sided job I could do halfway through on the back side and halfway through on the front side uh, and that will give me a nice clean cut so I'm going to do that let's do three-eighths of an inch on the back side and let's give ourselves a couple of tabs um, let's go with a sixteenth of an inch tab since I'm doing it from both sides and let's put uh, I'll put a tab here 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 and there and let's go ahead and uh, this will be my inner window that's a good name for it right inner window and we'll calculate that okay um, and so we'll preview that selected toolpath and of course that was uh, the wrong thing to do we want to be on the inside of the cut ladies and gentlemen the inside of the cut ladies and gentlemen uh, and then let's calculate that toolpath so let's go ahead and let's reset that preview and preview both of those again um, in all. <clears throat> there we go. All right, now let's flip over to the other side. And I'm going to take this uh, profile here and I'm going to actually copy it over to the other side because it has those um, tabs on there. So when I go back to the other side now, when I select on this vector and I do have a duplicate and that's okay I understand I got a duplicate there now but I want to create my profile toolpath cutting 3 eighths of an inch deep on the inside of the cut I'm gonna add tabs and the tabs should pop up just like they did and uh, I'm gonna put uh, we'll put a little zigzag ramp in there one inch and this will be my side one inner window just like the other one was called 0.25 in mil and we'll calculate that and so if we look at our swept profile our profile cut which should be the last thing we do and our inner window if we preview all the tool pass now for all sides ha <laughs> let's uh let's stop that uh let's get rid of <laughs> Oh, Laney, Laney, Laney. Let's get rid of that uh, threaded toolpath. <laughs> I still had the threaded toolpath in there. Let's delete that and uh, let's do that one more time. Let's reset this preview and preview all the sides. Hey, Jim, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And so let me see if I can get this cleaned up. All right, so we'll have our frame. And then if we flip it over to the other side, uh, let, me, let, me, let me make my view much higher for you guys. Give me a second, uh, my quality. Let's go with an extreme quality. And let's, uh, let's preview all sides again after that resets. So that way it's not so pixelated and it looks clear. So let it run through and uh, cut those uh, two sides again. And I noticed that we had a, a little bit of a fallout with the tabs. I want to make sure my tabs don't get cut out like they did. But And uh, Jim, you're joining us late tonight as a Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions or anything, um, you uh, just uh, type them in. Uh, welcome, Sam. Hello. And uh, yeah, absolutely. You could definitely make one of these frames. There's a good picture that was uh, um, that would fit in there perfectly, for sure. All right, almost done. All right, let's get rid of all these parts. And you see how on my inner piece here, 
Uh, you see how my tabs uh, got cut? They got cut because that pocket cut, there's nothing to attach it to, right? Uh, so what I need to do is um, figure that one out. I need to figure, I, I'm, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna need to do is I'm gonna need to cut this uh, instead of halfway through on one side and halfway through on the other, I have to cut it all the way through on the back side so my tabs will be attached down here where the meat is. But let's get rid of that piece um, and let's, uh, let's flip this around. So we've got our picture frame here. You know, this is our front side and our molded frame and everything. And uh, if we look at side two and all, We've got our, and let me get it where it's not so pixelated. We've got our rabbit where our glass, our picture, and our backer would go. And yeah, we do have these little dog bone fillets and everything, but for the back of a picture frame, that's not going to be that big of a deal uh, and, and all. Uh, but it is much better to do that than try to rounding off the corners of your glass or uh, you know your picture or your backer board. This just makes life much easier. So, um, Ken Singleton, uh, let me know uh, in the comment section if that answered your question. If that answered your question uh, on making a picture frame. But what I do want to do is I do want to go back into my 2D view and I want to fix my uh, inner window cutout. I'm actually going to be cutting it all the way through from the back side so my tabs will not get eliminated when I do that pocket cut. So, um, and uh, let me change my cut depth here. I'll go an eighth of an inch per pass. <clears throat> and uh, my tabs, I will make them around an eighth of an inch and hit calculate. And now uh, I need to go to the other side, side one, and I need to remove that inner window profile toolpath. I need to delete that. We won't use that at all. So if I were to reset this preview and we were to uh, preview it again uh, all the way through, you'll see now that my tabs will stay intact and everything. So let that molding profile, it's going to take a second for the molding profile because I turned my um, uh, resolution up so it's a little bit clearer for you guys and girls. And again, guys, this is an open Q&A. Please ask some questions uh, and uh, everything, and we'll go there. Uh, so Michael Parrish uh, says, a 3 16 inch radius double Roman OG groove router bit. Sometimes when you get a chance, could you show how to do this bit? Sure, Michael, I can do that. We have time. Uh, and that's a, that's a good one. So let me, I got to pull that bit up so I can look at the profile. Uh, if you had a tool number, that would be awesome, but uh, we can do that. And all right, almost done. So it's cutting out the inner window now. And you see my tabs now, uh, they have somewhere to attach to. Uh, they have somewhere to attach to. Now I'm gonna have to do a little cleanup. You know, I'm gonna have to trim those four tabs and I'm gonna have to do a light little bit of sanding to clean them up. But now we, you know, they're, they have somewhere to attach to. Before they were right in the middle of the material and that pocket where the glass and the frame goes was cutting them out, right? There was nothing there uh, and everything. And uh, you, um, you know, uh, you can do that. So, uh, I'm going to go into answering Michael's question about the Doble Roman OG. We'll add that to the tool database, but I do want to answer a question for Todd uh, while I'm pulling up this uh, Double Roman OG profile. But Todd says, have you ever used one of those door bits for CNC for like raised panels and stuff? Um, generally, uh, Todd, the uh, raised panel bits are generally quite wide. You know, I mean, they're huge. I would probably say they're a good three inches in diameter and stuff and the uh i i i wouldn't feel safe about using them uh uh you know a, 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 door, a raised panel door profile bit uh in the in the router 
uh, if I did, I would definitely be very low RPMs and, and very slow feed rate and stuff and very, very shallow pass steps and stuff. Um, but, you know, I know there's, you know, big, big uh, frame manufacturers and stuff like that. They are using those door type bits and raised panel bits on their CNC and stuff and everything. Um, but uh, I haven't used one. I use different profile bits to create my raised panel, like if I was doing a raised panel uh, for carving and stuff. And what I mean by that um, is if I go in and pull in a DXF file that I have, I have a DXF profile of, uh, let's see if I can search for them, half, half, router bit profiles magnate.net was really awesome about creating a DXF file for every one of their bits a profile for every one of their router bits that they have in their inventory uh, I like them for that they're cool but now you know we, we use uh, white side and a mana which are phenomenal bits but magnate actually created a DXF file of all of their router bit profiles and when it loads, you'll see it's a big file. It took a moment to load. But if we were to zoom in, um, they have uh, all of their tool numbers, what that bit's uh, definition is, and they have the uh, right half of the profile. They created the entire library of all of their profiles and things. And so I have a couple of these bits, Todd. Uh, and I have bits like the, uh, let's go over here. I have like the ro rope col uh, cutting bit. I have the uh, barley twist bit, uh, which is hiding right here. Uh, I have the barley twist bit profile and everything. Um, and so I can use a couple of different bits to create a raised panel look, but they're more manageable in size. Um, uh, they're more manageable in size, but I use this uh, DXF file I, I literally like if I'm doing a if I'm creating a special profile I'll come over here and I'll grab uh, the profile and I'll make a copy of it I'll put it in transform mode and I'll hold down my control key and I'll drag a copy off and let's say that I you know that's the Roman OG let's uh, let's see here let's go over to I might be able to find a double Roman OG for uh, Mar Michael's question but let's see here, what would be a good add-on to that? The classic, so we'll grab the classic here, hold down the control key and drag a copy of that off. And if I came in and let's say I put these two together, snap them together, I could, you know, by using both of those bits to cut out the profile, I could create a really nice, you know, decorative profile. I could, I could combine more than one bit. And you're creating profile toolpaths for each of those bits. Um, and uh, like, for instance, this bit, uh, the uh, classical bit goes from here to here. And so whatever that width is, if I looked at the width, um, I'd have a vector line where that center of that bit was cutting. And then I'd have another line where this bit is starting the center of this bit and I'd have two profile paths that I'd be running to with two separate bits to create that one long profile it's pretty cool and everything and um, we uh, you know it's a it's a really neat thing to do let me go in and turn this off let me turn this off because oh wait let, before I turn it off let me see if I got a double Roman OG uh, Michael said a 3 16th inch radius double Roman OG Groove router bit. Let me see if they've got a. They got a whole their whole library here, so I'm sure we'll find a double bead bit, bowl and tray bit, classic triple, shallow plunge cutting, um, cove and bead bit, router bit. Okay, it's not jumping out at me, so let's go ahead and turn that off and let me see if we can draw that profile in. I love drawing profile router bits anyway, so you guys will get to see how my approach to drawing a bit. Uh, I'm gonna pull up a uh, window and uh, 
I got some people text messaging me. So uh, give me a second. All right, let's see here. Uh, double three sixteenths, double Roman OG router bit. And what I'm doing is I'm Google searching so I can at least get a visual of the profile. Okay, a mana. All right. I'm gonna pull this on the screen, Michael. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, I think this is just a, this might be a single OG, but it doesn't have the guide bearing on it, right? It doesn't have the guide bearing. You don't want a bit with a bearing on it, but uh, would this be, uh, Michael, tell me yes or no, if this will be close enough uh, for you, uh, for me to draw in the profile to give you an idea how to add that bit. Uh, let me know if that'll be good enough for you. Um, this uh, this bit here you know let me know if that that bit profile will be good enough for you and I'll use that as the example oh wait he's already got a tool number uh, Michael threw it up there never mind um, or somebody threw a tool number in there William said uh, four nine two one four what what tool number is this all right here four nine two one four okay so that's a double Roman OG, but we need the we need the we need the profile. I don't know who's texting me, but uh, they know I'm in class. So um, we need the double Roman OG profile that does not have the guide bearing. We need uh, the um, we cannot have the guide bearing on there. If we use this, then we would need to. Uh, it's got to be a plungible cutting bit. But okay, I can still draw this profile in without that. That's fine. But we wouldn't use this bit. You would not use this bit. Uh, you would want the plunge version of this that does not have the bearing. You want that cutter, that cutter to go all the way across. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Let's. Uh, but let's draw this profile in. Let me come down here to. Uh, let me come up here. So we got an overall uh, diameter of uh, one and three eighths, a cutting height of seven eighths. It's got a uh, radius of a quarter of an inch. Okay, quarter inch radius on those two double O's. So let's go ahead and draw that in. So I'm gonna move this over. All right. And let's, uh, I'm gonna start off, I guys, I always start off with a rectangle uh, when I'm drawing my bits. And so uh, on this particular, uh, oops, let's, let's do this. And get back to uh, layer one here. Oh, let's add a new layer, turn that off. Okay, I always start with a rectangle and the size of my rectangle is basically the overall cutting height and diameter of the bit. So the diameter is one and three eighths. So uh, we're gonna go 1.375. I couldn't do that again twice if I wanted to. It actually drew it that way. And then seven eighths, 0.875 for the uh, cutting height. Okay. And so we have a quarter inch radius. Um, it looks to be, let's see here. Seven eighths and then quarter inch radius, and then it looks like it'll be about a sixteenth inch step over. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get my circle tool here, and let's uh, let's draw a circle here, and I want a quarter inch radius. And I'm gonna go into node editing mode and I'm gonna cut the vector right here on the left side and I'm gonna cut it at the bottom. And I'm gonna get rid of that top right side. Now from here, there looks to be a small 16th inch step over. Uh, so 0 0.06, let's zoom in a little bit more so I can get three decimal points in there, a little bit more, 
0.0625. All right, space bar to finish. And then from there, I have a, another quarter inch radius. And this one is Uh, where's my right side there? It gets snapped right there. And go into node editing mode, and I'm going to cut the vector here. And I'm going to cut the vector up here at the top. We'll get rid of that. And then from there, uh, let's look at our overall uh, height. Let's go ahead and join those three uh, together. And let's look at our overall height of this. And right now we're at a uh, height of half an inch and my cutter is seven eighths and that's that straight edge here. So uh, seven eighths uh, minus a half an inch. Uh, so let's go a line. And we're gonna go with a 90 degree angle and the length is gonna be 0 0.875 minus 0 0.5 equals 0.375 and then spacebar to finish okay and now I can um, you know trim this away let's go into node editing mode and let's cut the vector here and cut the vector here to get rid of this rectangle here. And we need the right side of the profile, so I need to mirror this, because I drew it from the left. I need to flip this basically uh, to the right, like that. Okay, so we can see that double Roman OG uh, profile. Uh, but I only need this right side when I'm going into my tool database. So I'm gonna go into my tool database with it selected, my tool database, and I'm gonna go new, form tool and it's going to create that uh, profile but now I have an overall diameter of an inch and a quarter here or an inch and an eighth but my overall diameter on that particular bit is an inch and three eighths that's because that's because on that bit there is some space here and there's a bearing you know there's a bearing you know here and everything so what you need to do is find out what the overall cutting diameter is of your bit that doesn't have the bearing Michael and whatever that overall diameter is uh, we need to add that space in here okay and then split it in half so let's say that my overall diameter let's say that my overall diameter was uh, here let's do this let me move this back over here. Let's say my overall diameter was not an inch and an eighth. Let's say that it was an uh, inch and uh, three eighths. So I want to move this relative move tool. I want to move it relative a negative 0.25. And then I want to join these two with a straight line. And that's gonna give me my flat bottom. But now I need to come into node editing and I need to cut this in half. Cut the vector there. Because I want just the right side of that profile. Okay? This would be my right side of my profile. So if I came back in here and went it would now with that proper drawing, if I came back in here and went into uh, you know my new form tool, I would have my inch and three eighths, you know, diameter and everything. Okay. All right. So that's how I would approach drawing a double Roman OG. A double Roman OG. All right. So great. We've got a lot of people popping in here. So hold on one second. Uh, Let's come down. Let's see here. Um, uh, 
Okay, so Michael, your bit is a Yonico uh, 1302, 1QT bit. Uh, let's see if I can pull that up and just show a picture of that bit. Uh, it is the Yonico 13021QT. 13021QT. And let's look at images. All right, let's pull that image up. Hold on, and I'll pull it over to the window so you all can see it. Yonikos are pretty decent bits. Um, all right, so on that uh, double Roman OG, uh, Mike, uh, the overall cutting length is 7 eighths of an inch. 7 eighths, and the overall height is a half inch. So it even shows you that straight little lip is an eighth inch tall, and then from the bottom of that lip to the bottom of the Roman OG is three eighths of an inch. So see how it's almost drawn in a rectangle. Uh, I use a rectangle to draw that out and uh, that's how I would create that. And then you just want to cut that in half and you want that half of that bit. So pretty cool stuff. Hopefully uh, that will help for you as well. Um, all right, let's see here. What do we got? Uh, tools today. Uh, Ronald says, Laney, what is the purpose of baking a model after creation in the spire? I have no discernible difference. Uh, also, should I put all the components on the same level during creation? That's a great question. Um, and let's, uh, let's see if we can uh, jump into a spire. And uh, Michael, I'm hoping that answered your question, bud. Uh, uh, it was it's straightforward so uh, hopefully that answers your question and that's how you would approach it alright so I'm gonna create a new file here and um, uh, let's uh, just create a new file and I'm gonna come into my modeling tools I'm in Aspire now guys and girls and I'm answering uh, Ronald's question of what's the purpose of baking a model in Aspire uh, and and what's the discernible difference okay so when you are, let me draw, let me draw a couple of things here. Um, actually, let me do this. Give me a second. Uh, downloads, where's my downloads at? There's my downloads. Do I not have? Well, son of a gun. Hold on a second. Hang tight for just a minute. Let me grab a. Uh, let me grab a vector real quick, guys. Bear with me just one second. Let's see, where do I want to put that? I want to put that on my desktop and we'll just call it Emma. All right, let's go back over here and let's uh, import from my desktop. Get old Mickey. It's a bad picture, but uh, let me trace this out real quick. Okay, so imagine, and this isn't the greatest picture in the world, but let's make this picture bigger. And this is old Mickey Mouse, and Disney don't come after me. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm just showing how you would draw Mickey. But um, uh, so with Mickey, we've got uh, these different things, and I'm going to create a model from Mickey here. So I'm going to go into my shape creating tool, and we always start with the foundation and work our way up. Um, we always start with the foundation and work our way up. So uh, with Mickey, I'm going to have a flat, uh, or, uh, sorry, a domed uh, profile, uh, and I'm going to go a full-on uh, 75-degree angle, 
but I'm going to uh, no base height. Well, yeah, no, I'll do a quarter inch base height, but I'm gonna limit the cut to a 16th of an inch. What this does, what this does or what this will do is when I create this, uh, it's gonna give me a flat surface uh, with rounded over edges for my foundation. Okay, so if we were to look at this, I've got a flat surface with rounded over edges. Okay, and so let's say that the uh, center part, uh, Mickey's face, that's just a flat profile and we'll go up an eighth of an inch and we'll add that. And then uh, Mickey's mouth, get Mickey's mouth in here uh, that's gonna be a flat eighth of an inch and we're gonna subtract that Click apply and we're going to take his tongue add that back in click apply I'm going eighth inch eighth inch eighth inch okay uh, Mickey's nose that's just a straight on no limit, uh, rounded profile, no limit, 90 degrees. Get that nice little button nose. Click apply. And then lastly, uh, Mickey's eyes is gonna be a 30 degree rounded profile, but it's gonna be a subtract to get him kind of sunk in and I'll tilt his face a little bit here after it creates this this component okay and I don't want no no uh, base height on that so I want to go zero base height on a nice transition there we go and then lastly his internal part of his eyes uh, we're gonna take those two and they're gonna be a flat profile about a sixteenth of an inch tall and uh, gonna add that back in and click apply sorry about the phone ringing in the background it'll go away in just a minute okay so now um, Ronald so now I have um, this Mickey model here and uh, I've got all of these components I got seven different components to create this one model now baking a model together basically it's like baking a cake you take your flour your eggs your water and, and whatever and you're mixing them together to make one cake right you're taking all these individual ingredients and baking them into a cake and what we're doing is by baking is we're taking all these individual models all these individual components components is another name for models and we're baking them into one complete model now when it comes to me and model creations and stuff I do not bake uh, my originals okay so you asked about putting them on different uh, you know levels and things like that within the component tree well my level one all of my individual components would be let's say on level one and what I would do is I would come in here and I would create a second level okay in this second level I could even rename it if I wanted to and let's rename this and we'll just call this our uh, you know finished model and level one I might as well uh, take level one and rename that since I'm renaming things and I'll call this my original components components okay so now on my original components I would take and I would select all of them I would go ahead and uh, group them together in some group and then I would duplicate that group I'm making a copy of them okay now you're gonna see the model get much fatter because now I have two copies of everything kind of like together and everything but we don't want that we're gonna take one of these groups and put it up in the finished model and when I do that, I'm going to turn off my original. I'm going to uncheck my original level. Okay, that is my originals. If I have to go back and change the nose, if I have to go back and change the eyes or the mouth, or you know, I want to change anything different and all, I have my original individual components to go back to that I can clean up or change. 
But on my group up here, on my finished model, all those individual components, if I'm done with my model and everything, I will bake them together. I will bake them together into one model. Okay? I'll bake them together into one model and everything. And you saw that cake rise, that green, when it rose up and went back down and everything. Um, you know, so uh, I have a baked model now that is one piece. And with it being baked now, and let's go into, um, let's go, let's maximize this view and stuff. With my model being baked, now I can go in and do smoothing. I can go in and do uh, any sculpting that I might want to do and stuff. Because to, in order to use those tools, you have to bake together the individual components into one. It, it, when it's molding, when it's, when it's smoothing, when it's, when it's uh, you know, sculpting and stuff, it, it has to sculpt off of one model. And so it's either, if you're going to do it individually, if you, if you don't bake them together, then it's only going to bake that or it's only going to sculpt that selected component. Uh, but I want to be able to sculpt everything. So I want to be able to add some smoothing to this, you know, like around the edges and the mouth and everything. I want to be able to open up my smoothing tool, a smoothing tool on that baked uh, model. And, um, Let it uh, generate it. And I want to be able to, you know, apply some smoothing around the edges and everything, you know, on my model and stuff. And the, um, the uh, component is, uh, you know, it's, it's smoothing everything because it's one. It's one. It's not a bunch of different individual ones and stuff and everything. So uh, the reason why you would bake is if you have to do any sculpting or uh, molding or smoothing or anything, and it's going to apply it to the whole model, or um, uh, you just want to maybe maybe I want to export this out and give it to someone, you know, as a model file or something, or or you know somebody sent me and said, hey, could you make a model for me? And uh, you know I sent it. I would have to export it out as an STL, and it has to be baked together uh, for me to do that. Uh, but I still have, you know, if I turn that baked finished model off and I turn my originals on and everything, my original component, I still have those originals intact that if I need to go in and change something, I can. You know, uh, they're not big together. I can, go, I can go and alter and change them if I, if I have to, you know. So maybe I need to go into the properties. And maybe I need to give you know this component some base height or something, uh, you know, to uh, make the change. And that was his nose, <laughs> like Pinocchio. Let's see if we can get his nose to grow, um, and all that stuff. You know, I might want to change that, or I might want to reduce the height of it, or subtract it. You know, I might want to suck his nose in or something. I have all those individual components, my original components that I can alter, but I always bake together a copy of it when I'm doing my final smoothing and cleanup and stuff. You do not have to bake your model together to create the tool pass and carve it and all that stuff. But if you're going to be exporting it out, if you're going to be smoothing it, if you're going to be adding, you know, uh, some sculpting and stuff to it, then you do need to bake it together. And it's basically taking all those individual parts and making them one. So let me know uh, if that answered your question, Ronald. All right, let's see here. Let's see. Ah, a QT bit. Cutie bit. Uh, that's why I couldn't find it. Uh, thought it was a cutie bit. <laughs> QT. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah it's spelled Q, letter Q, letter T. Not, not, not cutie like uh, me. Right, like me. Like cutie. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So, great questions so far, guys. Hopefully, I'm answering them, answering them in a way that you understand uh, what that is. So uh, to summarize that for you, Ronald, you do not have to bake your components uh, if you're just you know creating a model to create your tool pass and stuff. Um, but if you're going to be doing any smoothing or, or, or altering of it or whatever, it's a good idea to bake it. But I wouldn't bake the original. I would keep my original individual components intact, make a copy of them into another level, and those would be what I would bake. 
That way I always have my original to go back to uh, to alter or change in any way that I need see fit. Um, as far as levels goes, all of your components do not have to be on the same level. Uh, they could be on different levels for different reasons. Um, one of the uh, main reasons uh, that models would be on a different component. And this is this doesn't just apply, for, ladies and gentlemen, for Aspire. Now what I'm talking about applies to all the software. Uh, but let's say, that, for instance, that um, I come into my decorative here on my clip art that I have on my uh, computer. And let's say that, uh, let me see if I can, which one do I want to deal with here? Let's grab this guy. Okay. And let me go into my guidelines and delete all those. And let me, we're done with the Roman OG profile, so let me delete that. Okay. So I'm gonna grab that uh, model there and I'm gonna grab, uh, what's another good one? I'm gonna grab this guy right here. Now, in my component tree, uh, both of those currently right now are on the same level. They're in, they're in the same level group. But I have a cool option within the Vetric software, Desktop Pro or Aspire, uh, which is called mirror mode. And I can take my components and I can mirror them. And I can mirror from left to right, right to left, top to bottom, bottom to top. I can mirror different quadrants and all to create all kinds of cool things. And I may want to have one level mirroring in one direction or, or doing something and another level mirroring in another orientation. And I'll give you an, uh, an example of what I mean. Let's create a second level here. And I'm gonna put one of these uh, verses in uh, level two and one in level one. Now level one, uh, that's gonna be this guy right here. I wanna mirror that level one. I wanna turn on mirror mode from left to right. Meaning that everything on the left side, and I have to, I have to go in and split my view uh, so you can see this. So everything on my left side will get mirrored to the right side of my board. So if I separated them, it's gonna mirror them equal distance. If I move them closer to the center, you know, it's gonna blend them together to create a completely different looking component, you know, of some sort of fashion. I may wanna mirror left to right. Well, on this guy here, I don't wanna mirror him left to right. I, I, I really, uh, you know, wanna mirror him four times around in all four of my quadrants. So he's in the bottom right, right quadrant now. Uh, when, and quadrants. If I split, if I split this board down the middle from right here, let's do this. Let's get out of here. And if I split this board uh, down the center, okay, I have four quadrants. And this model here, this guy right here, he's in, uh, you know, quadrant number four. One, two, three, four. And so if I come into that mirror mode on him and I mirror him into my bottom right quadrant, it means anything that's in my bottom right, right quadrant is going to be mirrored to the other three quadrants. Okay, uh, let's turn off that number one flourish for a second. So now that guy is getting mirrored four times around. Now what happens if I move him more towards the center? So what if I move him up? And now he's overlapping the other quadrants and all. Now it's going to kind of connect them together, you know, uh, to create, you know, unique patterns and stuff. And everybody can do this. This isn't just Aspire. This is Desktop Pro and Aspire. Um, what if I want to take and uh, let's uh, rotate him a little bit. Let's get him rotated about like a, almost like a 45. And let's, uh, let's pull him up to where he's kind of overlapping a little bit there. And... Now you can see just from that one pattern, I was able to create this very unique looking uh, uh, model or you know what have you and stuff. Now let's turn on my other level that I've got mirroring from left to right. Okay. And let's get him, uh, let's get him sized down a little bit appropriately. And let's get him moved in to position. Uh, where do I want him? I want him up right about there. Okay. 
Now, right now, my two models are adding together, meaning the top one's like a sheet over a car. You know, if I drape a sheet over a car, it takes on the profile of the car. Well, I'm draping this level one over level two, and it's taking on the shape of level two, you know, what's underneath it. But if I turn on, uh, if I go to combine mode, and instead of an add, if I merge these two guys together, merge them together, uh, it will my my level one will uh, maintain um, and let's do a merge on this one as well uh, they'll maintain their shape and stuff and now on my properties of that flourish on level one I can give it a little bit of base height raise it up a little bit let's go up a little bit so it kind of stands proud there we go and uh, have it blend together and now if we look at my model you know, I don't know what in the heck I just created, but you know, it's a way of uh, you know creating uh, multiple um, you know uh, unique models from just mirroring a simple couple profiles and stuff. And so, because I have two different methods of mirroring, I have them in two different levels, Ronald. Uh, and that would be the purpose. That would be one purpose of me separating components by different levels other than that if there's if there's no real reason then keep them all on the same level you know uh you know if, if there's no real standout reason okay so and i did this in vcar pro so there you go all right any other questions guys come on we got we got plenty of time uh let me oh let me scroll up let me see i might be missing questions and all um, Ronald, Ronald, Harry's Place. Harry's Place says, uh, is there a special way that you would clamp this frame to the table, the picture frame? So let's go ahead and um, let's go uh, and turn this layer off. Let me get back into my 2D view here and kind of get uh, centered back up. Let me delete these guidelines and go back into my drawing tools here and let's go back into level one, my picture frame. So uh, uh, Harry's Place says, is there a special way that you would clamp this uh, frame so that, uh, you know, uh, for cutting out and everything? Well, two things. Uh, on the left and the so right side of this frame, if my frame was actually the same width as my board, uh, Harry, um, I would, on this profile cut, let's go to side one here. On this profile cut, I would add uh, some tabs. Uh, I would add, let's go ahead and edit tab. I'd put a tab here, 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 and here. And that way, my clamps, oops, um, and I would calculate that tool path with tabs and stuff. That way, that frame is held to these two outer pieces. So if I were to reset this preview and just uh, preview that, just that visible tool path for right now. So when that frame is uh, getting cut out, I have four tabs, essentially, um, holding that center frame to those two pieces and those two waist pieces out here that's where my you know if I had uh, clamps um, however many clamps we want let's go into this one and rotate it so imagine if I had a clamp here and uh, you know, a clamp here holding my board, or maybe four clamps or whatever. I could clamp it that way, uh, Harry. I could, it, because this is waste area out here, I could put four screws and I could screw it to my waste board. Uh, I could even put screws inside the center here because that's all waste area as well. But I, that's actually a nice piece. I'd actually cut that out and I'd use that for a smaller project or something. But I could screw it there. I could use double sided tape. I could use hot glue. Um, and uh, you know that would be that would be uh, how I would clamp this board to the table because I have waste out here that my frame is going to be tabbed to, so that when it's cut out, you know it's all held in place. So Harry, hopefully that answered your question.
Let me see what I got for. All right. <clears throat> you know. Um, but Harry said you said it was the side pieces that concerned you. Uh, those would be clamped to the table, and then my frame would be tabbed to it. You know, that's getting cut out. But usually my frame, my board is wider and longer, a little bit longer than my actual part that's getting cut out. So I have I have clamping I can do on all four sides and I would have tabs on all four sides. So David Kinsey comes with a question says, Laney, when using a waste board you showed, a, showed us a while back, when using the waste board you showed us a while back, uh, have you ever needed to use holes outside of the holes drilled within the range of your CNC to uh, the, the stop uh, to stop items from moving. Um, I have the mini and was thinking due to the size of the machine I might need to expand holes on the z-axis uh, to hold items tight when they push the z limits. Z is up and down, so I'm assuming that you might be referring to X or Y, David. Z is up and down. So um, uh, help me out on that. Um, but so basically what David's saying is I have a uh, waste board. Um, let me see if I can pull that up. And I'm getting, sorry about all the beeps and stuff in the background. Uh, I got some texts and st text messages rolling in, and everything. Uh, everything is catching up from today. They're all rolling in from uh, uh, customer. Okay, let's go. Uh, what am I trying to do here? Oh, I'm trying to minimize this. <laughs> I was like, I was like, there's something that I'm doing. Uh, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be pulling up the wasteboard. Uh, and uh, let's go into my flash drive. Um, <clears throat> Let me pull up this waste board here. So on this waste board um, that uh, will be popping up here in just a second <clears throat> for you guys and girls, uh, I have a series of holes that are three, uh, uh, three quarters in diameter, three eighths of an inch deep, and they're centered two inches on center. And so David's question was, when using the waste board you showed us a while back, um, have you ever needed to use holes outside of the holes drilled within the range of your CNC to stop items from moving. So uh, David is referring to in the areas outside of my range, have I ever needed to use holes uh, that, you know, um, to help, you know, maybe clamp or, or something apart to, to keep it from moving? Well, one of the things, David, that you'll see is uh, this is a new style waste board. It's a similar style with the cam clamping and everything. But this is a new style waste board that I've recently made that actually has uh, these individual strips. So it has T-slots in there as well. Uh, so that gives me a quite a bit of range because I can put uh, you know my clamps that have T-bolts and stuff in them anywhere on the table and all. And um, the, uh, so I have never, currently now, David, to answer your question, I've never had to use holes on the outside. If I did, I would have to use a Forstner bit and a drill to drill those, those three quarter inch holes because my CNC couldn't reach outside of that range. Um, my CNC is outside of that range. Uh, but with this new waste board, because I have now T-slots in there, these individual slots right here where I can slide a, a T-bolt, 
I can clamp, my clamps can kind of really be anywhere on the table. And these file, this file and everything, uh, David, uh, is available or going to be available for the Mini Carver and the 2440 uh, in the Digital Wood Carver Owners Group in a day or so. Um, but um, the this board offers me a lot of versatility to use uh, different style, different types of clamps and things. Um, let me see if I can let me see if I can get out of this um, for a second and screen capture uh, printout tile tile capture basic bear with me bear bear with me uh, table leg I have to pull up the picture this way. Almost there, ladies and gentlemen. Almost there. Maybe, maybe, just maybe it'll be there. Here it comes. All right, let me go down to uh, from current slide, from current slide. Get it on the screen for you guys and girls. So with my waste board, I can use uh, cam clamps. I can use wedge clamping. I can use uh, mechanical hold downs that use T-bolts. Uh, I can use vacuum clamping pods and everything all you know with this, with this one waste board and everything. So I have a lot of different uh, opportunities of different clamping methods and stuff. Um, and so uh, in adding those those individual slats instead of it being one solid board adding those individual slats creates that T slot for me uh, within the waste board uh, to give me the opportunity to use not only my cam clamps that fit in the holes and my fences that fit in the holes but now I can uh, include mechanical clamps and vacuum clamp pods and all that use T bolts and stuff uh, and then I have my wedge jig where I have a fence uh, that can slide into these T-tracks for wedge clamping and all. So it gives me a lot of different versatility and stuff uh, on the table and everything. So I, uh, I probably at some point in time may have had a reason to uh, possibly have extra clamping space, which led me into uh, designing this waste board, uh, David, uh, because that gives me the opportunity to use my mechanical clamps and they can be outside of the range outside of the range of the holes that are already cut in there. So please let me know if that answers your question. Um, I'm hoping it does. <clears throat> and William Edlin, uh, yes, I did finish my new waste board that I've been working on. Uh, that, that's this waste board here. And uh, there's step-by-step -step instructions gonna be available for it uh, and everything. And one of the things that you have to uh, be aware of is the only part of this that was really made on the CNC table was drilling the holes, you know, the the, the, the holes and everything, uh, and then the grid lines. Uh, everything else was done, you know, with like a table saw and drill, you know, drill press and stuff. But uh, there's step by step instructions on making it, you know, and and everything. That's very versatile uh, uh, waste board and stuff. Um, if I were to uh, exit out of this, <clears throat> well, maybe. If I were to exit out of this, and if I were to go back into um, let's 
this versatile waste board, you'll get a general glimpse of uh, the process. So if I were to go into uh, the slideshow, and everything. Uh, so the slats ran the full width of the table and they were four and seven eighths inches wide. Uh, and I got the first one on the table and I laid out the center of each of the T-tracks that were running down the table. Uh, from there, uh, I was able to uh, center of this uh, four and three quarters inch board, um, I was able to mark those center spots and I'll outline uh, the four T-tracks. Uh, that gave me the ability to drill those holes. And uh, from there, uh, on each of those individual pieces, I measured out a T-bolt uh, and it allowed me to ran, run those pieces through my table saw to create a little rabbit. So that way when two of those parts were together, uh, it creates this little uh, T-slot and everything. And uh, there's a close-up of the T-slot that it kind of creates so my T-bolts can slide in. Um, then I was checking and testing my countersink, you know, to see uh, what depth I want my countersink to be so that my one inch screws will be able to tighten those uh, individual parts down and uh, not bottom out in the bottom of the T-track. And so uh, once I was determined that I was able to create my countersinks and I used one inch machine screws with square bolts uh, for the square nuts uh, for the T-track. And then um, once I slid the first one in, I took my CNC and I checked on both ends to make sure that it was running true with my Y axis. And from there, once I, once I determined it was, I secured it down and made sure it was square with my T-tracks and stuff. And then I could slide all the other ones into place. Once they were slid into place, I was able to take uh, two T-bolts and go ahead and just put them in between uh, two of those individual slats. Uh, to create the spacing and once I had a spacing and everything I was able to secure each of the slats to the table uh, to create that T-track spacing for me uh, From there um, Now I you know I can use T-bolts and all that wonderful stuff after that uh, I did some uh, Testing to make sure I had nice, you know, uh, my T-bolts could move back and forth, you know without a lot of friction and stuff and everything and then it was time for me to surface the waste board within my cutting area and stuff. I was able to surface it down. And uh, then I was able to drill the series of holes and grids uh, for using a combination of different hold downs and things. Uh, I have my end jig uh, for uh, joint making and stuff, dovetails, miter joints, finger joints, or not miter, but mortise tenons and all that stuff. Um, and uh, ultimately uh, that was my waste board. So you know that was it that was it so you'll have step-by-step -step plans on that but a, a lot of the work was actually not done on the CNC just the holes and the guide drillings and all and everything um, <clears throat> yes uh, Peter Hearn uh, hopefully that little walkthrough kind of shows you the waste board that uh, you're talking about and I do have plans the plans will be available for the 2440 digital wood carver and the mini carver digital wood carver for those of you that might be interested in this uh, waste board for your CNC uh, this type of waste board for your CNC and everything um, uh, I can provide you the plans but you would have to adapt them specifically for your machine uh, uh, you know but I could make those available if, if people wanted them. All right, let's see here. Peter Hearn, uh, William, did you machine the parts on the CNC? Uh, William, the only parts that I machined on the CNC were the holes and the grid lines and then the surfacing of the waste board itself. Uh, the drilling I did with a hand drill and a quarter inch bit and a countersink bit as well. Um, my countersinks, I, I did use my drill press uh, so I could lock in the depth of the cut with my drill press. And then, um, but I use my table saw to cut the individual strips down to four and uh, three quarter inches wide by 30 inches. And uh, I use my table saw to create the little rabbits on each side that would end up making the T-tracks and all. Um, I do, William, I do use brass uh, T-bolts for my T-bolts. Uh, because if my router bit r happens to run into one of them, uh, I'd prefer it to run into a brass bolt more so than the other. So did uh, 
Did I lose somebody? Let me see here. I thought I lost a viewer. All right. There we go. Figured I might have been boring someone to death. Okay, let's see. Let's get back to, let's see if we have any questions. Uh, David, hopefully I answered your question, David. William, the files will be available for it uh, shortly. Uh, Peter... David says, for instance, if I'm doing a sign that is 25 inches long and 12 inches wide, but the carving is uh, only 18 inches wide, uh, it fits uh, within the cutting parameters, but not the holes uh, in the y-axis. Okay, David, good. Uh, because that you were, uh, I was, I was, wasn't quite understanding, but hopefully, uh, David, that 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 it, that explanation clears things up. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, that's what a T bolt is. It's basically almost like a toilet bolt, toilet uh, flange bolt, toilet flange bolt, T bolt, uh, T bolt. So yes, but they have T bolts. Uh, they sell T bolts now because there's a lot of you know T tracks and things like that, Rockler T tracks and and just you know off brand T tracks and stuff like that. Uh, but they have T bolts for them, and it looks like a toilet flange bolt. You can go down to Lowe's and Home Depot and buy toilet flange bolts, and it's the same thing. The only thing is, is the toilet flange bolts are more of an oval shape. They have more of an oval shape to them. A standard T bolt, the sides are flat, and then it has the rounded ends, um, and the uh let's see here <clears throat> the uh t-bolt has uh, a standard t-bolt has s flat sides so that it fits within the um uh, the T-Tracks and uh, William for the 2440 and the mini carvers you're, you want the quarter 20 T-Bolts you can buy them by the bulk in Amazon quarter 20 T-Bolts uh, if you buy the toilet flange bolts from like a Lowe's or Home Depot you're gonna have to grind off the sides flat uh, so that they will fit into the T-Track because it's more of an oval shape on those type of toilet flange bolts okay okay okie dokie so let's get back to uh, metric here. All right. So um, all right, Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie. Ronnie Probert, you're you're a digital wood carver customer, aren't you, Ronnie? Yes or no? Give me a yes or no. Because if so, those files for the new T uh, uh, waste board are going to be put up in the digital wood carver owners group. Uh, Hey, Bob from Kansas. Let's see here. Um, how did you secure the dovetail jig? Um, Bob, the dovetail joint, joint making jig uh, is available uh, at digitalwoodcarver.com. And it's for, um, it's for, let me get to that screen again. It's for CNC's that can carve over the front of their table. Uh, and... Um, this is secured with, uh, there's two, uh, T bolts in the back side here that actually slide into the T track. And I, this, I kept my jig in mind for when I was making the width of my slot, slit, slot, slat board, slats, my slats, because, uh, when perfectly spaced this second T track right here, my, uh, jig went into, but on the front here, these, this bolt hole here and here uh, there's actually a threaded insert uh, countersunk into this first slat uh, in position to where these two holes are and I have an Allen uh, bolt quarter 20 Allen uh, head bolt that screws down into that and into those two threaded inserts it's the only two threaded inserts that I have uh, on that and I don't know I don't think I have a close-up picture of that for some reason but uh, that way these two front bolts can be uh, recessed and everything 
uh, in order for um, my fences, my hold down fences and everything to be able to have free range of moving back and forth and stuff. And also, but that's how it was uh, attached to the T bolts in the back with these little wing nuts. And then uh, these bolts in the front here went down into two threaded inserts that I have uh, countersunk into this first slat. Now, if I ever have to replace this first slat, uh, I will have to reinstall those inserts and uh, remeasure and install those inserts on the front as well, which is not a big deal for me, not a big deal at all, uh, and everything. So that's how I secured that. Uh, that's how I secured that, Bob. Uh, Richard H. comes back and says, Did you find it better to cut the rabbit uh, in the uh, to create the T track uh, versus using T tracks themselves? Uh, absolutely absolutely and in here let me explain why so uh, Ron's H first part of his question was um, did I find it better to cut the rabbits in and everything uh, instead of using T tracks themselves one yes uh, one is because the the T slots are cut down low uh, and so I have a lot of meat here uh, uh, that you know I don't care how I tighten them down uh, it's it's not gonna bust through if I would have put a t-track in here I would have had to countersink that t-track uh, uh, you know below the surface so I could surface my wasteboard um, if I would have used an aluminum t-track and then that aluminum t-track would have been secured into this MDF with screws and there could have been a possibility of me if I was cranking real hard on my bolts and all that I could literally pop that that T track right out of the right out of the uh, MDF, you know. So I can surface this wasteboard down uh, quite a bit, and as far as my holes, I can countersink them further and further and use shorter and shorter screws to get this wasteboard down to where it's almost nothing. Or I can just replace individual slats. So yes, I found it much better to. Uh, make the T slots by cutting rabbits in each of the pieces uh, versus using aluminum T tracks because that aluminum T tracks would be s close to the surface. Uh, it'd be slightly recessed so I could do some surfacing but minimal surfacing. Uh, and there could be a potential if I was cranking down on a clamp for whatever reason uh, that I could pull that T track right out of the MDF. And so uh, with this, I have a lot of meat that I can really crank down on these. Uh, T bolts if I ever needed to. So that was the first part of uh, Richard's question. Let's go to the second part. I guess it would save your bits uh, as you keep surfacing your wasteboard. Yes. <laughs> yeah, as I keep surfacing my wasteboard, I would have a T track to contend with, right? So by making the slats actual T slots when they're spaced apart uh, gave me a range of freedom. Now my bolts, my bolts. That are holding down those individual slats right now they're recessed three eighths of an inch deep so i can i got a lot of surfacing i can still do but if i needed to surface down and i was getting close to those bolt heads uh, i can use shorter bolts instead of the one inch i could go down to three quarter and i could make my counter sinks a little bit deeper uh, so i got i got plenty of range and all there um ernest says uh uh, I like the design. Are you going to sell the plans for those of us who, uh, other than your CNC, or can I get a copy for my table? Uh, I, Ernest, I didn't have a plan on selling the plans. Uh, you know, for that table. You know, I could. I probably could do. You know, it'd probably benefit me if I did like a two or three dollar download or something. You know, to uh, and all for time and all. But I, I'll, I'll make the uh, plans available uh, for for individuals uh, that request. All I ask is I'll put my email address in the chat. Uh, if you just email me uh, with the subject line uh, "spoil board plans," "waste board plans," something like that, um, I will send them to you. But eventually, I may put those plans and instructions and everything for sale. Uh, you know, for digital download and stuff. But for right now, next couple weeks or whatever, uh, they'll be free. So uh, my email is in the chat room. So, uh, waste just subject line, waste board plans or spoil board plans or something like that, and uh, I'll know what it is. All right. So, guys and girls, it's 9-11. Oh, 9-11. Okay. 
Uh, let's get to any other questions, any other things. Um, my phone is just blowing up. Sorry about the little beeping that you hear in the background. Uh, 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 my phone's been acting up and, and text messages and things like that haven't been coming through when they're actually sent. And then at certain part of the time of the day, they just all kind of rush in uh, and stuff. And, uh, and all. But, oh my. So, uh, they just, they're just blowing up. So you hear those beeps. All right, take a sip of my Kool-Aid. Oh, a little announcement for those of you who ever are thinking about doing it, because some, sometimes some people do that every once in a while. I'm no longer drinking Dr. Pepper. So for those of you who've ever sent me cases of Dr. Pepper in the mail or a case of Dr. Pepper in the mail uh, for a holiday or a thank you or something like that, thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, don't do that anymore because I won't be able to drink it. Uh, I, um, uh, I had to move strictly to uh, something a little bit healthier. Uh, fruit juices uh, or or water and stuff because uh, last weekend I passed a kidney stone and it was not pleasant it was very painful and uh, my consumption of soda Dr. Pepper specifically might have had something to do with it and just by saying that I've done lots of Dr. Pepper endorsement now and they'll never endorse me but uh, I don't know if that's the case but the doctor did say hey cut back on your soda intake so no more Dr. Pepper for me uh, I don't know how I'm gonna survive uh, but uh, the juices have been doing good so far. <laughs> uh, yes, Alan Dabrowski, I sure can. I will add that to your request with those files and stuff. All right, let's see here. Uh, William says, uh, oh, uh, Tool Junkie jumps back and says, was it easier to use the table saw instead of using a T-slot router bit? Well, um, if I would have uh, secured those individual slats to my table and stuff, um, uh, I wouldn't have been able, my cutting area, my router bit wouldn't have been able to get to the outside, uh, you know, to plunge down to create that T-slot and back up. I didn't know, you know, I don't have that range. I uh, didn't have that range and stuff. I would have had to have secured those individual slats to my CNC and used a, you know, I could have just turned them upside down and used an end mill, right? And ran an end mill profile profile twice and I could have used my CNC to cut the slats I didn't have to use the table saw uh, I would have had to secure each one of those individual pieces securing them in some way uh, that there was no clamps in the way maybe at the two ends or something because my router bit would have to come and cut that slot that rabbit on one side come over and cut the rabbit on the other side and I could have done each of those individual that way not a problem at all I found it easier uh, to um, uh, lower my on my table saw lower my blade set my fence run all my parts through on both sides and stuff or you know one side first uh, and uh, keep moving my fence over until that slot was done and then go back to my start point rotate them 180 degrees and run all of those individual there was nine nine of them in all together on the table saw. I found it easier doing that way I could have ran them on my router table with a quarter inch uh, end mill you know set down low I could have cut those rabbits on my router table I could have cut them on my you know I cut them on my table saw but I could have done them on my CNC as well so there was a lot of different ways of doing it uh, for me because I was actually using my CNC uh, to you know put the parts on and get things laid out and stuff it was easier for me to do the little rabbit cuts on each piece on my table saw um, but I wouldn't have needed to use a t-slot cutter I could have but I'm a little leery well, I couldn't have used a T-slot cutter because, again, my range, my T-slots are running along my Y-axis, and my y, my table is 30 inches wide, but my Y-axis cutting area is 24. So I wouldn't have been able to get out to the outside to come and plunge. But also, I'm also a little leery of running a bit that close to my, because I would have had to been kissing the top of my tabletop as I was cutting that T-slot and everything. Um, so uh, it was not... A T-slot bit would would never have been an option for me at all, period. It would either have been cutting those rabbits with a end mill, a quarter inch end mill, doing two profile cuts on each edge of the board on my CNC, using my router table and a fence and just uh, rabbiting out those uh, both edges of my boards, or using my table saw to cut those rabbits on both edges of the boards. That were my three options and everything, and that's what I would advise for you as well.
if you were to do that. Um, Uh, William Edlin, uh, great question. What date do we need to place the DWC parts orders uh, for the Ocala meeting uh, for the free shipping? Uh, that uh, don't order tonight. Tomorrow, William, the uh, coupon code is going to be posted uh, for those orders uh, and everything for your actually not only just free shipping but also a five percent discount. And uh, that cutoff date, most likely with the uh, that user group meeting being the. 25th and the 26th most likely the cutoff date is going to be around the 19th or the 20th of July but don't place your order just yet because uh, there's going to be a coupon code posted uh, and uh, also for for a small discount and also free shipping okay and, and you'll see that tomorrow you'll see that tomorrow in the digital recover owners group um, yeah so there you go, uh, Tool Junkie. You can, uh, Bob, great Bob. Let me, oh, I gotta go back up and see, you gave me your name. Uh, bear with me a second. Uh, Bob, yeah. Uh, Bob, using your router table, uh, absolutely, you can use your router table. There would be no need for a T-slot bit because you're not cutting in the middle of the material. You're cutting rabbits on both edges. So just a regular router bit, regular end mill, quarter inch end mill, what have you. And by the way, those rabbits uh, were um, about three sixteenths, three sixteenths by, uh, I think about three sixteenths inches deep. Um, what I did was, uh, as you'll see here, um, let me go back into that picture. What I did was, is I took a T-bolt and I marked uh, each edge of where it needed to be cut. And then I turned that T-bolt 90 degrees to, to make sure that my slots, my rabbits weren't too wide, that that bolt would just be spinning in there, right? I want it to be able to lock. So uh, this was about an eighth of an inch from the edge of the board to that pencil marks, about an eighth of an inch. And I went another 16th of an inch off of that uh, to cut my uh, little rabbits. So my rabbits were 3 16 inch wide on each edge of the board by 3 16 uh, 3 16 of an inch deep. Um, oops, hold on. Uh, do I have a close up of that? Yeah. So about 3 16 of an inch wide by 3 16 of an inch deep. Um, yeah, well, actually, that's probably about a quarter of an inch deep. That looks to be about a quarter of an inch deep. 3 16 inch wide by a quarter of an inch deep uh, and everything. And uh, that's how, you know, um, those T-bolts were, those T-slots. And those are those are the parts stacked on top of each other, you know, after I ran them through the table saw. All right, any other questions regarding the Vetric software, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, anything, any obstacles that you run into and you need help with, uh, now's the time to post those questions. Otherwise, uh, we're going to go ahead and call it an early night. Uh, it's 9:19. Uh, if we don't have any other questions at all, we'll uh, we'll go to about uh, 9:25. Uh, so in about five minutes, unless I see other questions pop up, and um, uh, we'll, we'll call it a night. I hope some of the questions that were asked. And some of the answers that you saw, I hope that helps you in your endeavors. And again, if if uh, the, that type of um, that type of uh, te um, waste board is something that appeals to you, uh, I will provide uh, the the files and everything for it, the instructions. But you have to adapt it to your CNC. Okay, you've got to adapt it to your CNC and your specific setup. All right. Um, the holes, uh, you know, across the top, the grids and things like that. You'll have to make some modifications because they were designed for our digital woodcarver 2440 models and our digital woodcarver mini carver models. Uh, but they're they're universal, right? It could be on any CNC. Uh, you just have to go in and, and make some small adapt adaptations to fit your needs in your machine. Okay, and uh, we got. Uh, <coughs> David uh, popped back in and said, um, 
When I cut my T-Tracks on my current waste board, uh, I made a guide board uh, to put between each section so that I would have even spacing. There you go. There you go. Uh, David put a, um, when he was cutting his uh, T-Tracks, he put a guide board uh, uh, to put in between each section so he would have even spacing and everything. That's cool. Um, is there a tool in the Vetric software that allows you to draw exact degrees, angle degrees? Um, well, the only tool that I could specify for you uh, on that one, Bob, is your guidelines. And what I mean by that is let me create a new layer here. And let me turn off all these other layers and stuff. And so um, let's say that I need to create, oops. <laughs> let's say I need to create a, an angle. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and click, uh, let's go here. Let's say I need to create an angle. Well, one, my freehand drawing, the letter A shows me the angle of my line you know, at that particular time. My tool over here, my tool over here, I can actually uh, tell it the angle. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, let's say I wanna go that 30 degrees, um, it would be 90, all right, so zero is straight across to the right, 90 is above, and then these degrees here, even though it says 15 degrees, 20 degrees, and all that stuff, it actually starts counting from 90 all the way back to 360. So if I wanted an angle to run this way, acute angle, uh, let's say of 35 degrees, then my angle would be 90 plus 35 for 125 degrees, and my length would be, let's say, two inches, and I would click Add to create that, you know, that angle. So I could use that over here in that box. But, but one of the things that I would recommend is using your guidelines. So let's say I have a guideline here. And let's say I have another guideline here. And I need this guideline to, if I right click on this guideline, uh, if I right click on this guideline, I can change my angle. So let's say I wanna go um, 100 and, uh, 135, 135, come on now, 135, I could click apply, and um, that, you know, I now have almost like a protractor or, or drafting square or whatever you want to call it, where I can take and draw my guidelines and, you know, create those angles. And then, of course, I could always uh, keep the guidelines. I could just turn them off by turning off the visibility, or I could delete them in all together. So when you're when you're working with a guideline, if you right click on the guideline, you get the properties, and you can change the angle to whatever angle you need. You know, for that guideline and stuff. Uh, and when you you know change that, it creates that angle, and now you you can use your polyline tool or or what have you to create, you know, whatever uh, lines and stuff you need to be. And then of course, again, if I turn my guidelines off, you know, have that angle. So that would be how I would use the, uh, the guidelines is almost like a drafting square. Um, or I would use, if I was freehand drawing, you know, I would use the angle that shows up on the screen under that L, L is length and A is angle or I would use my next point angle. You know, if I wanted to be 90 degrees, five inches long and click add, that's gonna create that five degree, uh, you know, inch long. And if I go in here and come over here and say uh, 125 degrees, four inches and click add, you know, I can just start all the way around whatever it needs to be um, to create my, you know, complete my entire shape. But I would use the guidelines because that's like a protractor in itself. You know, so the guidelines, you can rotate them uh, at different angles like a protractor. Great questions. Okay, great questions. Um, 
All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, any more questions? Let's see. Now's the time. Sam, are you still in the group? You don't have any questions? You're about to be converting over to, uh, you're about to be making this new waste board and uh, uh, on your 2440. You got no question? But, um, all right. Dead silence. Well, I appreciate everyone uh, popping in tonight and uh, all the great questions. Hopefully, I got. Uh, hopefully, I answered all of them, uh, and I did not miss anybody's uh, question or statement or anything like that. And hopefully, the answers that I gave will be helpful to you. Will be helpful to you in uh, your upcoming endeavors and everything. Um, all right, Sam is still there. All right. <laughs> understandable I'll answer those questions later all right ladies and gentlemen until next time have a great night thanks for joining me tonight and uh, I hope uh, I hope there was a little bit of something a little nugget of information that you were able to pull from tonight's Q&A I try to do these at least once a month uh, maybe it might be a recap or touching answering questions on past projects or things like this and stuff and uh, I really hope that uh, in these Q&A's that you guys and girls you know you have questions and you ask them because I would love to answer them I love to really get it to you all to a point to where when you run into an obstacle you know how to overcome that obstacle uh, and um, and you're not alone I run into obstacles, everybody runs into, everybody in that group runs into an obstacle in one way or another. And uh, so don't ever, there's no such thing as a dumb question. There's no such thing as a, as a, 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 a you know, a newbie question, you know, oh, I don't want to sound like a newbie and all that stuff and all, oh, I hear that so many times. You have to, you have to ask questions. I don't, as a, as a new user, even as an existing user, you got to ask questions to get those answers. And uh, I want to be the guy that could help that you can turn to to get those questions answered. And thanks for subscribing to my channel. Please like, share, you know, uh, all that wonderful stuff because it really helps out the channel. And until next time, I'll see you soon. I want to thank you for joining us today on Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. If you're watching Spindle TV on YouTube, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. You can find out more information about our trend products by visiting us at www.digitalwoodcarver.com.